Welcome, everybody, to the Investing with IBD podcast, sponsored by Scoofus Capital Management. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, and it is Wednesday, August 17th, 2022. And on the show, as always, we have Arusha Pires, O'Neill Global Advisors, Portfolio Manager. How you doing, Arusha? I'm doing well, Justin. Glad to have you and uh, uh, those two little helmets behind you, which are just <laughs> fun to see. I mean, I don't know what they are, but they, they don't look good. I'm just going to put it that way. Uh, football season is coming, so we've got uh, we've well, got that I, I to look forward to. I can't blame you, Justin. Uh, you know, with UCLA, you usually see the backs of USC's jerseys, and you're never going to see the backs of UC's Not... jerseys this year running to the end zone. So, <laughs> Okay. Well, in addition to having football season to look forward to, we really got a great show to look forward to today. Um, on the show today, we have Omid Malakan. He is a adjunct professor at Columbia Business School, and he kind of styles himself the explainer in chief of cryptocurrency. He's got a book out called uh, Re-Architecting Trust, The Curse of History and the Crypto Cure for Money Markets and Platforms. Uh, that's in addition to his previous book, The Story of Bo Blockchain, A Beginner's Guide to the Technology That Nobody Understands. So Omid, it's really great having you. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Justin. Happy to be here. And uh, we might as well, because we were just talking about it before we went live, uh, you have a very interesting poster for those Pink Floyd f fans. It's not quite the triangle that you might have recognized. Uh, what, what, what is that behind you? That is the what I a take on what I consider the greatest album cover of all time, the cover for Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. But instead of the uh, prism in the original, it's the Ethereum logo. Okay. Uh, so Ethereum is the second most prominent blockchain and cryptocurrency after bitcoin so that's the dark side of ethereum so which we can get into yes absolutely so it may, maybe we start there is it did pink floyd get you into blockchain and cryptocurrency or <laughs> <laughs> how, how did that happen maybe you just kind of talk a little bit about how that uh how you got into it in the first place well pink floyd may have gotten me into certain kinds of experimental substances <laughs> right. which then allowed me to expand my mind to the point where i can appreciate <laughs> blockchain okay. and crypto um, might be good. explaining too much, Mr. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We could, hey, we can edit that out and post if you need us to. <laughs> you just let us know. <laughs> no, no. Actually, full transparency is one okay. of the defining okay. features of my world. So very, good Very good point. Very good point. I originally have a Wall Street background. I was a trader, futures trader for a number of years and worked in a few other sort of back office type capacities. Uh, and in the late 2013, 2014 period, when I had completely left finance and was doing different things. A friend of mine asked me to help her acquire a little bit of Bitcoin. Uh, now, at that point, I myself had zero interest in this. Like most people, I probably thought of it as this like funny Internet money that only mm -hmm. appeals to drug dealers. But um, I did want to help my friend. And I actually opened an account for her at uh, Coinbase, the popular exchange, bought her a little bit of Bitcoin. And then I transfer those coins to my own computer or a wallet in my own computer. Mind you, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know what any of this meant. I probably, I think, just followed a YouTube video or something on how to mm -hmm. do it. But nevertheless, about 10, 15 minutes later, my computer pops up a little alert that says, your Bitcoin is now here. Mm -hmm. And that kind of blew my mind because, as I'm sure you guys know, and anybody who's worked in traditional finance, nothing that you own is ever actually here in fact nothing that you own is ever actually really yours because whether we're talking about cash in the bank stocks bonds commodities there's usually an army of intermediaries brokers exchanges custodians clearing houses between you and your asset and what fascinated me about uh the bitcoin was that that wasn't the case for better and for worse because I, I had also been warned by people like hey don't make any mistakes. If you lose your wallet password or send your coins to the wrong person, then there's nobody to call. Right? That's like the downside of decentralization. Um, this began my sort of personal trip down the rabbit hole because I was just fascinated by this idea that you now have a digital item. Bitcoin only exists on cyberspace, but it has these physical properties like scarcity, the fact that there is a limited supply. The downside of which is that like a dollar bill or a bar of gold, if you lose it, it's gone forever. You can't get a replacement. And um, you know, all these years later, 
I've managed to make a career out of trying to explain to other people how this technology works, what it means, and why it might be relevant to them someday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, and did, so you, maybe, did you ever uh, transfer that Bitcoin to your friend, or did it just stay on your computer? <laughs> I just, I'm kind of curious about that. I want to make sure we follow up. Uh, no, no. That, I wish. Actually, I wish I had <laughs> bought some Bitcoin for myself because I think that was when it was at like three hundred dollars or something. Okay. Well, no, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. gone up a little bit since then. Just a little. Yeah, what what did you have, Arusha? Yeah, well, I I think maybe we should take a step back even from Bitcoin and look at the technology that enabled that Bitcoin to transfer, right, from uh, from your friend to you. Uh, And so, yeah, maybe go over uh, the technology, maybe the blockchain technology that enables all of this. Yeah, Uh, the one way to think about it is blockchain is sort of like the network or the platform. And then Bitcoin is just one of many assets that could ride on it. The simplest way to think about blockchain is anybody who's done anything in finance, you know that ledgers are everything, right? Like what is your bank other than a bunch of ledgers that track its assets and liabilities? Your broker is the same thing. Every company has a balance sheet, et cetera. The problem with the world today is that a lot of the ledgers that we use, while they might look like they're very advanced and digital, they are using the same exact design that's been around for 50 years at least, if not even longer. And they don't take advantage of certain unique attributes of the world today. Like we all have some kind of a computer, right? Mm -hmm. Most of us in our, on our desk, or maybe even in our pocket, we're all connected 24 seven. You know, borders don't really matter that much anymore because information travels seamlessly. I actually don't even know where you guys are located, but isn't it interesting that it doesn't matter, right? Like, and you never halfway. will know. We will not tell you. No. <laughs> That's usually what the people who have a lot of Bitcoin say because they don't want to get back. <laughs> um, so, blockchain to me is just if you were to sit there and say, I want to invent a modern financial ledger that takes advantage of all the technology and digital and, and fancy goodness that the world has to offer, you would end up with a blockchain. For example, um, you know, we all know that like if you're working on an Excel spreadsheet in your computer, you should back it up, right? You should mm-hmm. have two copies. And like most companies have some redundancy. But in a world where everybody has a computer and is connected, why don't we all just have our own copies? So the Bitcoin blockchain, which is really just the ledger that tracks like this person had one coin and send it to that person who then sent half of it to somebody else. Um, there are thousands and thousands of copies of it all over the world. I actually have my own copy of it running on a little computer called the Raspberry Pi on my desk right here. And that's just, it adds resilience, right? Like mm-hmm. the more copies you are, the better off everybody is. Um, alternatively, uh, cryptography is used to make a blockchain and what we call an append only ledger, a fancy way of saying once you can only make new entries, you can't delete existing ones. So for anyone who's worked in any setting where the audit trail matters, this is actually a great feature. Um, you, you know, it's, it's just you keep adding to it, but you can't change the past, which which is fine. Like you could still make mistakes, but then you need to now make a new entry. You can't just mm-hmm. go back and delete it. So this is just a, one of many trust building features of blockchain. Other features include the fact that everything's totally transparent. So I could actually literally go look at my little copy of the ledger here and you can just pull up one of god knows how many websites that uh, ping data from a copy of the ledger and we can look at every single transaction that's ever happened and that's a way that we can build confidence in using this Um, there are a few other features most people probably get confused about this whole business of mining like what does it mean that somebody mines bitcoin right right and to summarize that because the goal was to have a decentralized ledger or payment system, not have a corporation or government in charge. The hardest question to answer was like, how do we update it? Right? Like everything I described so far, me having my own copy of an append only database that's fully transparent, that's well and good. But how do the 10, 15,000 people that are currently keeping the Bitcoin blockchain alive agree on what's a valid transaction and what's not? Um, This is actually an interesting field of study that goes back decades to the early days of computer science. How do you get computers to agree on stuff, particularly in a world where somebody's computer might crash and somebody else might be trying to actually intentionally trick the other computers because they're trying to steal coins or commit fraud or something. Mining is the admittedly complicated but still elegant way where volunteers are tasked with 
checking like if I'm sending a coin to Justin to make sure that I didn't already send it to Arusha. And mm -hmm. then um, because we don't even know who the miners are, it's decentralized, everyone's anonymous, financial incentives are used. So what we understand as Bitcoin inflation, everybody's probably heard that like there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoins and the number that gets created every day gets cut in half, blah, 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 every four years. That's literally bribing the miners to do an honest job. Because one of the biggest innovations of Bitcoin is this idea that in the absence of an authority, you can use financial incentives to achieve honest outcomes. Mm -hmm. And as proof, mm -hmm. I submit the fact that the Bitcoin ledger has been updated I don't know, hundreds of thousands of times in the last 10 plus years. There are now something more than half a trillion dollars worth of value on it. Billions of payments get made every day. The, the network itself has never been compromised. It's never made a mistake. It's never been down and it's never processed a single fraudulent transaction. Wow. That's a pretty good track record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. So you, you, you bring up Bitcoin and, and now that we know the kind of the basis, the, the transparency, the, the redundancy and, and accuracy and everything, how does that translate into a currency? Like, why why use blockchain to, to create a currency and how does that work exactly as a currency so the funny thing about the invention of bitcoin like this anonymous person satoshi nakamoto um if you go back and read their work they actually were not trying to invent a new currency like the original bitcoin paper that launched this whole thing only mentions the word currency once um they were trying to invent a decentralized payment system. Right? It was this question, it was 2008, financial crisis was raging, banks were on the verge of collapsing. So the challenge was, can we build a digital way to send something of value back and forth without relying on an intermediary? And then it turns out to make a decentralized payment system secure, you have to also give it its own currency. Really just because what I said earlier, you need to bribe people to be honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, the way you bribe them is by having your own money that you can or, or the protocol, the algorithm prints a little bit. So that introduces this idea of Bitcoin as a currency. But it, it's important to know that you can't separate Bitcoin from the network. I've heard people make this argument like, well, why can't we just have the same idea of a decentralized network, but only have dollars on there? The answer is because we can't print dollars to pay miners to do an honest job. Only the Federal Reserve gets to print dollars. So this interesting symbiotic relationship between the network or the platform underneath and the currency on top is both something new and fascinating and also very confusing because then it gets to the question of like, well, what is that currency worth? How do I value it? Like I know, well, there are models where I can try to value a dollar but then Bitcoin is very different from a dollar. Bitcoin is also a byproduct of the network effects of the underlying network, right? Like everybody knows like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, a lot of their values from this idea of network effects because a lot of people rely on them. Bitcoin also has network effects. It's just, there's no Bitcoin Inc whose stock you can buy to capture that value. So it ends up accruing to the coin. And, and so what was like, so in, in 2017, you know, that's probably the first time it really attracted mainstream kind of attention when it went on its first initial run. What was what was kind of the the big catalyst that got it going? And I think it hit 20,000 or close to 20,000 at that point before correcting a bunch. There's actually been a couple of those kinds of boom bust cycles. Well, more than a couple. It's been like every couple of years in the history right. of Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. There's a boom bust cycle. And Usually it has to do with some combination of people realizing that blockchain technology is actually useful, sometimes even not even for like Bitcoin, right? Like we now I, one of the things that propelled the price moves in the last up the most recent bull market was that a lot of central banks are actually now experimenting with using some version of this technology to digitize fiat currency. Mm -hmm. um, and while on the surface, that sounds like, oh, it's competition for Bitcoin. It really like blesses the idea of Bitcoin, right. uh, this new way of having digital money. And um, historically, things have, that have had macro events other than the adoption of the 
blockchain technology. They've included things like um, in 2013, there was a banking crisis in Cyprus um, where the banks were sort of bailed in in that like some of the depositors money was confiscated in order to fund the bailout. Uh, the, I believe if I recall correctly, back in 2016, 2017, one of the drivers was capital controls in China. Oh, wow. And people using because Bitcoin's decentralized, it's a lot harder for a government to restrict access to it. Yeah. So yeah. people were using it to get money out of China. Wow. Uh, but it's usually uh, multi variable. Mm -hmm. So like the 2020, 2021 rally, part of it was like this idea of Bitcoin as an inflation hedge. Right. Um, then there was this idea that for the first time, institutions were beginning to adopt it. There were some famous hedge fund managers that bought it. Uh, and then the, the application of the technology continues to sort of like move downstream and people keep finding new ways to build new things on blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm glad you mentioned this uh, idea behind the inflation hedge, you know, and, you know, of course, El Salvador uh, famously you know, kind of said, OK, we're going to we're going to adopt Bitcoin as one of our currencies. And um, a lot of people have been talking about it as an inflation hedge, a store of value, um, you know, all of these things. And I mean, we, we, we just got into some pretty high inflation and Bitcoin didn't really seem to give an inflation hedge there. <laughs> why? Why not? And are we are we thinking are, are we maybe giving it too much credit of what it can do at this point? So with the caveat that I am not a macroeconomist, although I have played one on YouTube before. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you can play I, one here anytime you want. Right, exactly. <laughs> this will be on YouTube. So yeah. it's a, yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> then, then this is my domain. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing about it's true. So far this year, we've had a lot of in inflation and Bitcoin is way down. But as far as I can tell, so is everything else, including mm -hmm. gold is way down. In fact, I think I saw that gold has now given back pretty much all of its post-COVID gains. Um, stocks are down, bonds are down, real estate is turning. Uh, I, I think like the strongest asset this year has been the U.S. dollar. And right. one of the few things that have been stronger than the dollar is the Russian ruble, which is actually up on the dollar since the invasion started. So the, the first conclusion I make from that is nobody knows anything, particularly when it comes to macroeconomics. But um, the second one is that I think something that can be an inflation hedge, whether it's Bitcoin or gold or stocks or rubles, uh, you have to measure it across the span of years. And you have to sort of factor out the noise that you get in the short term because markets are a discounting mechanism. So presumably, a lot of the inflation that we're seeing today in things like the CPI report um, was priced in by assets like Bitcoin and gold last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, you, when we were talking yesterday, you, you had a really interesting analogy that I think it made a lot of sense to me. You, you talked about looking at because because it's not necessarily just Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is kind of the the, the granddaddy, right? It, it's kind of the the stable one in in this whole world, relatively stable, right? Ooh. Exactly, relatively, <laughs> exactly. Um, versus uh, a, a number of these other uh, a, a number of these other coins that have even gone bust. And so you, you used an interesting analogy about early stage equity starting a, r a restaurant. Why don't you share that with everyone? Because I think that that really helped me kind of understand where we are in this phase right now of crypto and, and Bitcoin. Even though Bitcoin and a lot of these other cryptos are called currencies, they really are these experimental projects and the applications have now moved downstream to the point where people are trying to design crypto projects that actually do just what corporations do, like cloud storage. Mm -hmm. um, well, because blockchain is this ultra efficient digital technology, one of the things it lets you do is whatever the unit of value is, right? Call it a currency, a coin, a token, that's semantic, right? Whatever the thing is that people buy and sell, you can issue it from day one and it can start trading from day one and it can have price discovery from day one. Like that's very different from like most even successful early stage start startups. They raise money in the private market. So maybe they have like a fundraising once a year where they get a price put on their shares. Um, a lot of these crypto tokens just start trading right away. 
even like before the project set to launch. And that's this cool idea that you now have liquidity and price discovery on early stage equity. So the analogy is like, imagine if someone opened a restaurant and issued tradable shares on that restaurant from day one, right? Maybe even before they opened their doors, what you would see, first of all, is crazy volatility because who knows if this restaurant's even going to make it. So a little bit of news like, oh, they got the liquor license that would make the stock soar. Right. And then it's like, oh, wait, no, you know, the oven's going to be delivered a month later than we thought. Now the stock's going to crash. So I view that I use this as like a filter for a lot of the noise in crypto. Um, I think eventually the projects that do survive, which again, going back to the restaurant analogy, most restaurants in the long run won't make it right. Most startups don't make it. So most of the crypto projects out there won't make it, not because they're bad, but just because that's how startups work. The ones who do make it, I imagine some years from now will be a lot less volatile than they are today in the same way that the shares of like a popular restaurant chain isn't that volatile. Yeah, and I, I guess I would just add a, another parallel that I've, that I've always kind of put with uh, what's going on with crypto right now. It's very similar to the, the early days of dot com, right in 98, right. 2000, where you had any company that put dot com behind its name was a rocket ship <laughs> right. at that point. But once 2000 came around, who needs a business model, right? Exactly. All the ones that that weren't legit companies, they all went out of business, you know, you know, rest in peace, pets dot com. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but then you had Amazon, you had eBay, you had a number of number of these other companies, the few companies uh that were able to survive they ended up becoming uh huge uh, uh huge companies and did really well in the stock market and, and in business it's a great analogy well when we come back we're going to talk a little bit about the survivors here and uh what applications we can use with blockchain and cryptocurrency stay tuned we'll be right back peter skoufis founder of skoufis capital has successfully managed money using bill o'neill's strategy for the last 17 years Peter's missed major market crashes, such as the financial crisis of 2008, and most recently, the coronavirus crash of 2020. One of his strengths is finding new leadership in new market uptrends. If you would like to talk to Peter and get his thoughts on the current market and what to do now, or get a complimentary review of your portfolio, feel free to contact him at scoofuscapital.com. That's S-K-O-U-F-I-S capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L dot com. And fill out the contact form or by calling 866-562-2634. Protect your capital and don't miss the next market uptrend. Welcome back to Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Scoofus Capital Management. It's Justin Nielsen here along with my weekly guest, Arusha Pierce from O'Neill Global Advisors and our special guest this week, the explainer in chief of blockchain and cryptocurrency. It's Omid Malakan, and he is an adjunct professor from Columbia and author of a number of books on cryptocurrency and blockchain. So um, I guess since we've gotten kind of the the basics of, of cryptocurrency and blockchain, the next question to me is with all these great things that it does in terms of transparency and accuracy and you know what you were talking about with this ledger. So who gets displaced here who you know just as the automobile displaced the horse and buggy who is going to be that uh i guess victim of creative destruction with this new technology intermediaries who don't evolve their business model so mm -hmm. and that's a little bit that might be a different answer than what you get from a lot of crypto people are you know rah rah the downfall of the dollar and the downfall of the banking system and the downfall of this and that is inevitable I disagree with that. Um, I think the history of innovation and disruption is that the old industries often end up co-opting the new technology and hanging around. Mm -hmm. um, it's just you know, they're often not as important as they were because you have these new players that arise. And what's interesting about crypto is that the new players might actually be these decentralized networks like Ethereum, on top of which you can already do a lot of things that otherwise would go through a bank or a fintech. Like I can send you dollars on Ethereum. Uh, there are decentralized exchanges that mimic what say a New York stock exchange might do, but with some unique features because they're on a blockchain. So a lot of those intermediaries are at risk. It's gonna take years for this to play out, but 
I don't think we're going to live in this like completely libertarian where there are no corporations and, and this sort of utopian or depending on your point of view, <laughs> dystopian world. Um, <laughs> Because the funny thing with like there are certain unique aspects of crypto that actually make a trusted financial institution more valuable and more important. And I'll give you a perfect example. We touched on before on how blockchain gives digital items physical properties like you take self custody, which is cool uh, until you like lose your password and then realize all your money has <laughs> gone. That is not cool. No, and no. The, the history of finance is that even with physical things like gold, people have always sought out the help of trusted institutions to help them secure it, protect it, lend it, borrow it, etc. And uh, there's already a sort of a technological arms race for digital asset or crypto custody. Mm -hmm. There are startups that have gotten very high valuations that provide this service. There are even some of the biggest custodians on Wall Street, like Bank of New York Mellon, have announced that they're building out their ability to custody your Bitcoins and other crypto assets for you. And I think that's just one of many examples of the things that traditional intermediaries will be able to do. It's just that they're going to have to evolve their business model and learn a few tricks. So when people are hearing this right now, right, because you, you really explained it well, get, I'm sure you're getting a number of the listeners interested in this. How, how if they're completely new to this, how do they put this into action? Do they go and set up an account with Coinbase? Do they go and start setting up their own private wallet where they have a chance to lose their key and never see their money again? What, what are kind of the first steps that they should take to really start learning about Bitcoin and by putting a little bit of money to it? Well, the first step always is to read my book. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Although it, 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 I do, I do actually, I think learning about this stuff is, is important, not just from an investment point of view, but because it might end up impacting your career, your profession, whatever it might be. And, but the best kind of learning is when you have a little bit of skin in the game. Yeah. So I think everybody should try to do something. Uh, I'm not an investment advisor. And if you're going to invest in crypto, just remember, it is very volatile. Like it's sort of like think of it like the way if you trade options, how crazy like you're five times your money or and then suddenly it goes down 90 percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crypto can act that way. For most people, if all you want to do is invest and in going through some kind of a uh, reliable institution like an exchange like coinbase or even like uh robin hood paypal that's fine mm -hmm. uh in fact it might be the safer thing to do until you learn how to really take the extra steps to protect your asset if you are going to self-custody but even if you do say just like buy some crypto through coinbase or your bank i do recommend going through the process of setting up your own wallet on your phone or your computer transfer just a tiny amount of your investment to it and then just like, you know, tell a friend that you want to pay for lunch with it or something just to get your hands dirty mm -hmm. and to understand both the potential of the technology and frankly, many of its limitations today. Right. How, how difficult is that to do right now? And maybe you do it a couple of years from now and maybe it's different. Maybe it's uh, more, more easy. Now, mm -hmm. maybe we can also have you talk a little bit about, again, for the investment side. How about something like Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, uh, GBTC is the ticker symbol here. So for a lot of people that didn't want to go through the process of, you know, buying Bitcoin itself and they just wanted to profit from the move and, and look at the technical action, the chart and see see how they could profit. What what does this offer and what are some of the limitations uh, of, of GBTC? First, a bit of background. There's been this race to figure out how to let people invest in Bitcoin through traditional financial infrastructure, like your existing bank or broker. And the most obvious way of doing that by far is with an ETF. In the same way, there's a gold ETF, there's a silver ETF. Um, in the US, however, for reasons I won't get into, the SEC refuses to approve a Bitcoin ETF. In many other countries, including Canada, they already have them. So GBTC is like a closed end fund. Uh, it's a trust. Uh, and it was one of the first ways, though, that you could just go to your like Schwab brokerage account and get exposure to Bitcoin. And because in the beginning, like two, three, four years ago, it was the only way to do this. It would always trade at a premium, sometimes like a 20, 30 percent premium. People would literally pay up just to not have to deal with opening an account at an exchange. And for institutions, maybe they couldn't like maybe. 
the risk people said like, oh, we don't know about crypto exchanges. You can't open an account there. What's happened in the last couple of years, though, is as other ways of investing in Bitcoin through traditional market infrastructure have come online, the premium has flipped to a severe discount. I think uh, last check it was like in the 30 percent ballpark. And this is kind of remarkable because literally all GBTC is it's basically a fund that has Bitcoins. I believe they're custodied at Coinbase custody and then it issues shares against them. So for something like that to trade at a 30 percent discount is interesting. The reason why, though, is because it's not an EDF as an ETF. As of now, there's no way to redeem. If there was arbitrageurs would come in, buy the shares, redeem, get the Bitcoin, sell right. them, lock in that 30 percent. Today, you can't do that. The company has been fighting tooth and nail to get the SEC to let it convert to an ETF. In fact, they're now suing the SEC, which wow. is kind of rare. Um, and they hired uh, President Obama, Solicitor General, to lead wow. the charge. Wow. So this this is like high stakes stuff. Um, so for anybody who wants to own it today, one way to think about it is that you're getting Bitcoin at a 30 somewhat percent discount. The downsides are until this convertibility is approved or the company Grayscale that issues it decides to liquidate the fund, there's no reason why that gap would close. Right. And it's pretty it's an expensive product. It's a two percent annual fee on it. So the question to ask is like, when do you think or do you think the SEC will eventually let it convert to an ETF? If so, when will that happen? Alternatively, could the company just give up at some point due to, frankly, pressure from a lot of its investors that like, hey, just liquidate this damn thing and let us get our money back? <laughs> right. So what about uh, another option that ProShares released uh, over the last year or two? Uh, BITO, the pro shares Bitcoin. Uh, what's the difference between this versus the, the grayscale option? Oh, I'm, I'm, Rusha, I'm glad you brought this up because I should have mentioned it. That is technically a Bitcoin ETF, but it's not a simple ETF that's just backed by, for those who are listening, I'm doing air quotes, physical <laughs> Bitcoin. Um, it's an ETF that is backed by the cash settled CME Bitcoin futures. And this is an SEC approved product because the CME futures exist in the regulated perimeter. So the SEC was comfortable with them. The downside of those and really any futures backed ETF is that futures markets are kind of funky. The, the contracts keep expiring. Right. So if, you, if you're just an ETF that owns futures, you have to keep selling one month and buying the other or one quarter and the other. And sometimes there's a curve to the futures, like maybe three months out, Bitcoin is a lot more expensive or cheaper for various reasons. And so there's usually a negative tracking error associated with these kind okay. of ETFs. Um, so it will, for now, not trade at a severe discount like GBTC will, but it's not going to be a perfect one-to-one -one follower of the price of Bitcoin either. Yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about that with, you know, some of your leveraged ETFs that got so popular, mm. you know, because yeah. they are using derivatives uh, and futures and stuff like that. You you do suffer from contango and backwardation. And, you know, those are things that you can look up on Investopedia if you want to get into the math behind it. But, um, yeah, I, I, I see what you mean there. Uh, that can, especially long term, depending on the way those are rolling, uh, can have some pretty, pretty major effects over time. Yeah, and recently... In fact, I believe near the recent price lows, the SEC did approve a uh, inverse Bitcoin ETF. So oh, no an ETF wow. to, to be short Bitcoin. But as sounds like you guys have already discussed here, those just have crazy tracking here. In fact, like <laughs> right. if you ever you look at a short those shorts. Yeah. And if you ever look at the prospectus <laughs> of a lot of these ETFs, it says like the long term value of this product is zero. Right. So I'm always when when the SEC keeps rejecting a Bitcoin ETF, I'm like, whatever you think of Bitcoin, like it's at least like it's not expected to go to zero, like right. all these levered and inverse right. ETFs yeah. that you guys keep approving. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 pretty crazy. So um, I guess the, the the question, the other question here is, what is what does the future look like here for? for cryptocurrency. And uh, I know your students probably always ask you first day of school, do we buy Bitcoin now? Uh, right. So <laughs> how do you know when it's when it's time kind of thing? <laughs> you know, how do you know when it's, when, you know, the, the old uh, Dustin Hoffman and Lawrence Olivier, it, is it safe? <laughs> uh, 
I don't know if it's safe. And I, I as I tell my <laughs> students, I, I always tell them like, it, the only thing I know that it's time for is it's time to learn. And then they boo me and frown. And <laughs> um, I, I, I guess if I had to say like, it's probably a better buy at whatever it is now, 23,000 than when it was at 69,000 less than mm -hmm. a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so Bitcoin, I think increasingly is becoming like a potential global reserve asset. So I'm not going to say about prices, but here's what I would keep an eye on. With everything that's happened in the world in the past couple of years, particularly with like the U.S. freezing Russia and Afghanistan's foreign exchange reserves, mm -hmm. I have a theory that in the long run, Bitcoin will become a reserve asset that central banks, they're not going to put all their money in Bitcoin, but like maybe they'll put 2% of their money in Bitcoin because it exists completely outside the banking system. They can transact it freely, regardless of what like the U.S. Treasury Department does with OFAC sanctions and whatnot. That's something to keep an eye on as a potential bullish indicator if it happens. Another one is just a general trend of institutional adoption. Uh, crypto is a rare asset class that it began as a retail phenomenon mm -hmm. and is now going institutional, unlike things like ETFs, which went in the opposite direction. If institutional adoption continues, I think that's going to be bullish. And we got the news recently that BlackRock is actually building its own GPTC type competitor for its institutional clients. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And then for everything else, because we've been talking about Bitcoin, but then there's like Ethereum and all the applications built on top of it, man, many other blockchains. The thing to look out for is actual adoption and adoption beyond speculating. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, the long term thesis of all of this, which I try to present in my new book, is that this is like a better financial system. It's a better way to do banking and payments and even things like art and gaming so far most of the hype has been around investments people bidding right. up tokens because they think you know some years from now that will happen sort of like arusha's analogy of like you know the dot-com bubble everyone was like pricing companies on eyeballs and not even questioning mm -hmm. whether an eyeball right. means anything right. mm -hmm. the eventual bull market in tech that began that we're, I guess we're still in now was really based on like, no, people were buying stuff on Amazon. People were doing Google searches. People were signing up for Facebook. So I want in the next, in this crypto bear market, I'm really think I'm looking at those kinds of adoption metrics. And if they start to tick up, I think that's going to be a very good buy signal. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's get a little bit further into so, some of the cryptos. I mean, you have the Ethereum poster behind you. Are, are do you favor Ethereum versus a Bitcoin or is there some other kind of crypto that you think is more interesting? Because I, I know others who, who are really into this whenever they'll they'll throw out a coin and tell me about a coin that they're really excited about. And they're in. Then we'll talk about the applications of the coin. Right. It's not just a store of value. It's some it's some application and being used for some other stuff. Uh, yeah. So why don't you talk a little bit about that, of how these kind of differ? It's not always just kind of a store of value. No, and it's not either or either. Like I think yep. some of these, while I think the vast majority of the coins out there today will go to zero, I also think in the future, I actually think in the future, everything's going to be tokenized. So your stocks and your dollars, your digital monkey pictures. Yes, that's a thing. Um, <laughs> uh, but a very potentially, expensive thing, right? right yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but potentially your, uh, your, the deed to your house um, mm -hmm. could, you know, or, or maybe like the, there's actually like media outlets that are playing around with the token that's your subscription. So I could get a IBD subscription, it's a token. And then if I wanna like share it with my friend, I send it to her wallet for the next few days so she can read some stuff and then she can send it back to me. Hmm. So there, those kind of applications I think will be the future of everything. And none of that is gonna be on Bitcoin. Bitcoin is Bitcoin's appeal is its simplicity. It is totally decentralized, but almost to a fault because like when something's totally decentralized, you can't update it, you can't upgrade it. So Ethereum then enters the picture as like this platform that you can build all sorts of stuff on and people are building all sorts of crazy stuff on it. So I actually think in the long, long run, this might take 10, 15 years. Ethereum or something like it will be a lot more valuable than Bitcoin. Uh, for the same reason that like, you know, the stock market is a lot more valuable than gold, right? Mm -hmm. Gold as a store of value is cool. It's ancient, but like, there's not much you can do with it, but the stock market is oil stocks and banks and tech and whatever comes out five years from now. 
So Ethereum will be interesting for that reason. And right now, people in crypto are excited for a more short-term reason. Um, Ethereum has actually been rallying significantly against Bitcoin off the recent lows. It's come up the most. The reason why is its security framework is migrating from the way Bitcoin works with miners who you have to wait, spend money on electricity and then they get paid in a coin to a new way of doing things called proof of stake. Right. Um, I won't get into the details. It's just a different way of securing a decentralized network. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about a blockchain that uses proof of stake is anybody that has the token, like you guys or me, can mm -hmm. actually use it or, or um, deposit it in order to participate in securing this whole thing and then earn a yield. Mm -hmm. So what's going to be interesting about Ethereum is that it's going to, if everything goes well with what they call the merge, it's just this, this upgrade that should happen sometime in the next month or so. After that, Ethereum will be a the first major cryptocurrency. Other coins have done this or were born like this, but it's going to be the first major cryptocurrency that has what you could think of as like the risk-free rate. Mm -hmm. And that could be one, two, three percent. It's not going to be fixed. It's going to fluctuate based on network activity. And people are excited about that, right? Because they're like, oh, if you have a risk-free rate, then institutions might come in just for the yield. And then you can do other kinds of interesting financial modeling the same way we do with like, you know, the Fed rate or treasury rates or something like that. So once, once things get to this point where, again, maybe it's 10, 15 years out where um, these applications are out and some of this is more functional as a currency, does it then kind of lose its appeal as a speculative thing i mean does the volatility kind of decrease at that point and you get something that is more stable like like a currency uh like the dollar um and again when when you usually think of things that give you yield you're usually thinking of things that uh don't move as much uh is, is that is that the future here that's a great point i hadn't thought about it like that but yeah i think for the um, for what we call a layer one, like Ethereum's a layer one, Bitcoin is also a layer one. But for the base platforms, then that will probably be the case that they they'll have a token. It they might be worth a lot, but they're not going to be like going up and down like crazy. Sort of like how utilities don't go up and down like right. crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're always making money and they're safe in that way, but they're not going to be making like triple the money next year. Mm -hmm. um, then though the action will move to what's built on top of that so the way to think about it then is like ethereum might become a very mature platform but if somebody does figure out how to build decentralized cloud computing like aws on the mm -hmm. blockchain that's an oversimplification but there are people working on stuff like this if they succeed then you're like oh well what's the value of aws azure and google cloud combined right maybe that's a blockchain project with a token and then as that gains traction the token will appreciate in the same way frankly that like amazon stock did due to the success of aws hmm. uh, so how early are we in this cycle i've heard some parallels and i'll go back using the internet analogy that essentially if you're looking at the internet we're around 94 95 in the internet cycle we're, we're so early because still you know even though more people are familiar with it they still really can't wrap their heads around it as a kind of like in 95 where you just had some really kind of web page and you're like ah, oh, yeah i guess this is kind of cool but you didn't really kind of it was hard to really grasp the applications to your normal life i like that analogy i think it, it, it's that early or since we were talking about football earlier it's like it's like halfway through the first quarter uh, uh -huh. which means my New York Jets have already thrown two picks. But, <laughs> but, you know, as any sports fan knows, halfway through the first quarter, you say there's still a lot of football left to play. We can bring right. it back in the second half. So it's, it's still way early. And this is why I'm so excited. I, it's almost like fun to get to work in this industry. But to anyone in your audience who's curious about learning, I promise you it's not too late. And the best time to learn is in a bear market like now, because there's just less hype, less craziness. Um, the monkey pictures have fallen in value, not as much as maybe they should, but <laughs> it's a good time to um, get a little bit of something, play with something, ask questions, listen to podcasts like this, read books, and uh, come up with your own thesis of how the future will play out.
Mm-hmm. And one more other question, just very quickly. You know, aren't you supposed to be living in Miami? I thought everyone else was really into this <laughs> in Miami. Actually, the, the hardcore crypto people moved to Puerto Rico. Oh, because, that's right. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Because like, there's, you don't have to pay federal taxes after six months or something. But I have to tell you, as much as I love my industry, I don't necessarily love a lot of the people in it. And if, if I was trapped on a tropical island with with only crypto people, there's there's no amount of tax savings that would make that <laughs> to make it worth it yeah. for you. Okay. Well, uh, speaking of that learning, you know, again, uh, you know, hopefully this podcast has uh, helped people kind of get get their heads wrapped around this. But of course, uh, there's there's your book, The Story of Blockchain, A Beginner's Guide to the Technology That Nobody Understands, and your most recent book, just as a reminder, uh, that's Rearchitecting Trust, The Curse of History, and The Crypto Cure for Money Markets and Platforms. And then also people can uh, go ahead and maybe give you a follow. What is your Twitter handle? Omen? It's at Malikan Ohms. My last name, M-A-L-E-K-A-N and O-M-S, like Sam. Yeah. And are, are you a frequent tweeter? Uh, do you give a lot of information on there? I do. Yeah. I actually, I, I often um, write for different kinds of media outlets. Uh, I do a lot of like blogging and essays and stuff. And the easiest way to follow all of that stuff is on Twitter. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I think there's a lot to look into here and uh, wrap our heads around. So hopefully this is something that helps our audience. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing your knowledge. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed the conversation. Absolutely. And when we come back, Arusha and I will take a look at the market, see what's going on there and talk about a few stocks that are on our radar. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Peter Skoufis, founder of Skoufis Capital, has successfully managed money using Bill O'Neill's strategy for the last 17 years. Peter's missed major market crashes, such as the financial crisis of 2008, and most recently, the coronavirus crash of 2020. One of his strengths is finding new leadership in new market uptrends. If you would like to talk to Peter and get his thoughts on the current market and what to do now, or get a complimentary review of your portfolio, feel free to contact him at scoofuscapital.com. That's S-K-O-U-F-I-S capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L dot com. And fill out the contact form or by calling 866-562-2634. Protect your capital and don't miss the next market uptrend. Okay, welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Scoofus Capital Management. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host and my weekly guest, Arusha Pires, O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. So Arusha, let's talk a little bit about the market. Um, uh, we've been going up you know, quite a bit. Uh, ran into a little bit of resistance. I mean, if we, you know, look at the NASDAQ, uh, we kind of got up to that 13,000 level, hesitated a little bit. The S&P 500 bumped its head right there at the 200-day moving average line. Um, And, you know, the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Russell 2000 both got above their 200-day lines, but now are seeming to, you know, struggle a little bit around that, around that line so and of course we're going to be going through some more charts here and as always if you want to see some of the charts on video we do have our video portion of the podcast at investors.com slash podcast so arusha um is it is this now looking more like a bear market rally to you and now it's time to roll over or is it not dead yet yeah it's not dead yet it's it's hard to know whether it's a bear market rally or not, it, uh, you know, in the back of my head, uh, I, and my opinion is that it is, but I've been completely wrong on that over the last three, four weeks, because uh, it's gone up a lot further than than I could imagine it would go. But uh, we're still below the 200. Uh, a number of the groups that are still working are still more defensive related. But that being said, this weekend, Justin, when I was going through a bunch of screens and a bunch of stocks, I wrote I wrote down more stocks than I have had to write in in the last like five six months. I was just kind of it, it, the routine was really long this week. It, was, it just yeah. kept going and going. I was like, I can't. What was your hand stocks. cramping? You're like, oh my gosh, it's not <laughs> yes. used to this. It's, yeah, uh, I, 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 I should have sure. I should have stretched first. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, I was, and that's usually an indication when I see a, a lot of stocks that are they're not all set up perfectly, but they're starting to set up. And so a lot of times when I see that, that's telling me that underneath the surface, things are getting better. 
And so that's why I was a little hesitant that I don't know if it's a bear market rally anymore or kind of a classic bear market rally. I, what I think it is kind of classic right now is it's climbing a wall of worry, right, mm-hmm. where everyone is still or most people out there or a lot of people out there are still very negative. They still are convinced that we need another leg down, that we're going to have a much uh, a really bad recession and uh, they can't see this market ever going up. And the market goes up, right? Because the market always does the opposite of what everyone wants it to do. And so it just really kind of has this feeling of uh, it's climbing a wall of worry. It's resilient. And uh, there are some stocks that are slowly working, but it's not our kind of classic market just yet where a lot of great growth stocks are breaking out. Stocks that have these great, huge uh, stories to them that have a potential to change the world and um, are really kind of fit the models that we look for. It's more kind of defensive stocks, which makes me a little bit more hesitant, but still tells me that you need to have some exposure to the market. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that I I was looking at, and we mentioned this on IBD Live, is if you uh, type in NASDQ in, into MarketSmith, uh, you'll get some of the, the market indicators um, and you know, you have to go to the daily to to look at this. Um, it doesn't work on different different time periods, uh, just the daily. But the bottom chart here is the new highs and new lows. It takes a ten day moving average, and you can see that the the new highs has finally started coming up a little bit, um, and the new lows has come down dramatically. Uh, so th- there there is a little bit of improvement here. Um, also, if you look at GMI AB, which is going to show you the advanced decline line for the Nasdaq. Um, that's that's looking a little bit better. That's that's perked up. Uh, so it's not like this is something that's being driven by just a few stocks. There's more stocks participating, more stocks above their 50-day and 200-day lines. You know, which is good. But again, that doesn't mean necessarily that it's all clear. As you said, there's all of these things that um, could detract from the. The rally, most of which centers around what the Fed is going to do, how aggressive that hiking is going to be. And it seems like that's one of the things that um, has been on the minds of a lot of investors. And you can kind of see that volatility with even what the projections are, the future funds watch, Fed funds watch. Sometimes it's going to be, oh, 75 basis points, uh, 100% chance that it's going to be that. And then news will come out, some data will come out, and it drops down to 50 all of a sudden. And so it seems like that's that's certainly driving things. Um, but at the end of the day, I feel like we just have to look at the day-to-day action because you never know if it's a bear market rally or if it's truly the market bottom until months after the fact. You know, then it becomes obvious, like, oh, yeah, of course, you know, that's, you know, the signs were there that that was going to work. But uh, I, I think right now it's just too early to tell. So you have to kind of look at the day-to-day action and adjust your strategy accordingly. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, going going back and uh, the beauty of this whole system is that you have a follow-through day and you look for something to buy, right? Mm-hmm. It's that simple. And so the market will slowly pull you in when things are starting to work. And sometimes it may take a number of weeks or even sometimes longer than that to to have stocks setting up and so it can keep pulling you in to get a lot more aggressive. But you, it's simple enough that there's always gonna be noise, especially at the bottom, right? The, noise, yeah. the, the news is always gonna be really bad. Uh, there's always gonna be the worries of what the Fed's gonna do or what uh, how companies are gonna report and it's always enough noise to keep you on the sidelines. And honestly, I've been guilty of, of that this time around where I haven't been, you know, I, I have exposure to market, but not nearly as much as I should uh, because I didn't follow the signals this time, right? The market kind of just wore me down. And, and but looking back, it's like, you know, we had that fall today. It, you have to just kind of take all of them seriously and all at face value. Yes, some are going to fail, but there's going to be one where it's going to work and you definitely don't want to buy at that point. And so far, this one is working. We'll see if this is truly the beginning of a bull market. And as you said, that's more after the fact. 
but the last month or so it has worked decently it's just not our classic kind of bull market yeah. but you know what? 2009 wasn't like that too in the beginning right it Absolutely. took a number of months and then growth stocks came around yeah i mean the the, the market bottomed we had the follow through day in march of 09 I feel like it wasn't until June, um, yeah, or really, July. I remember June, like July Apple, that yeah. growth, you know, started really, you know, coming on a little bit stronger. And, you know, you did have a lot of things like this market that were moving off their bottoms. That was driving the market forward, and that that was one of the things that made this follow through day particularly tough because that's just not our style to buy things off the bottom. So uh, very tricky in that regard. But uh, let's get into some of the stocks. Um, and, you know, maybe we can start with a reminder that, hey, nothing's safe here. Um, Harmony, uh, Harmony Biosciences. Uh, I think this was on a lot of people's radar. Uh, this this was kind of doing these pullbacks, but it seemed like it was, you know, pulling back in an orderly fashion. Uh, biotechs have certainly been taking center stage a lot of the biotechs have been looking very strong and the biotech group is number three out of 197 mm -hmm. so whether you're playing that with an etf like ibb or xbi or one of the leveraged ones um a lot of biotechs ha have been working but then harmony just out of the blue today uh down what was it seven eight percent yeah set seven percent by the close um a lot of that happened immediately i mean it was it was at the at the start of the day so what, what, what's your take on, you know, seeing stocks like this that look fine until they don't? Yeah, I, and this is why I feel like you should have exposure in the market, but you shouldn't be aggressive, though, mm -hmm. too, right? Because there are pitfalls, and there's always going to be pitfalls, even if, when you're in a great market. But it just seems like there's still enough kind of pitfalls around where either it's a breakout that fails very quickly or a stock like Harmony that was setting up really nicely in one of the strongest industry groups and pulling back to the 50 and then out of the blue just is down 7% breaking that 50. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, so, so that the examples like this still make me, you know, they just kind of tell me that, okay, have exposure, but we're not in that kind of rip roaring fat pitch type of market that, uh, we, we, you know, we love uh, and where you can really push it at that point. Mm -hmm. Let's let's talk a little bit about oil and gas, because this was certainly at the beginning of the year, one of the strongest areas. And, you know, it, it just felt like I mean, if you look at like XLE or USO or UNG, it felt like it kind of got the rug pulled out from underneath it in, in May and, you know, really, really kind of started June very poorly. But now. These aren't um, these aren't acting the same. You know, you've got USO, which is still struggling to get back, but you've got UNG, which is the nat natural gas side, that looks like your classic almost cup with handle, right? That it's it's breaking out of. Um, so maybe we can look at one of the big heavyweights, Exxon Mobil, and the ticker symbol there is XOM. And you know, if you're looking at XLE, just know a lot of times it's gonna track a lot of what XOM is doing. XLE is, of course, the sector spider ETF for energy. Um, and XOM is a 20% weight in that. Uh, Chevron is another 20%. But what's your take on ExxonMobil here? We, we finally got back above the 50-day moving average line. Uh, we're arguably making just like a, a low handle here, but it's staying above that 50-day line. Um, do you think oil is maybe not done yet after the big move it's had? Yeah, I, I think there's a chance that it's not done simply because everyone's written it off again, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, where, it, where it started to run into trouble is when everyone was, was just all about oil. And obviously, the, the, there was a lot of concern because gas prices were going up crazy amounts and oils just keep going up. And, and then you're having the whole war in Ukraine. And, and so there was, uh, right. there was huge concerns there that oil could just keep, keep going up and never stop going down. And then, of course the market always fools most of the people it takes a break at that point comes in really hard shakes everyone out now no one wants to buy oil or no one's talking about oil anymore uh and so it wouldn't surprise me to see some of these stocks and oil start to act better again just because it just goes the opposite of what what everyone like i'm i wasn't i'm hardly looking at oil until this week uh or last couple of weeks when i said wow you know there are actually a number of these stocks like an exxon is above the 50 Right now, it's setting up around the 50. 
Uh, as you said, there's it's building like a little handle here. You can see like I drew a little descending trend line on it. Uh, and this is not the only one. There are a number of stocks that are kind of look like Exxon uh, yeah. within this uh, within these industry groups where it's telling me that, hey, if they start kind of moving up, uh, kind of breaking through these little resistance levels, they might have a chance to break out, test their highs. And so uh, they are setting up the relative strength line is lagging a little bit here. But uh, I think they're worth keeping an eye on right now and not writing off. Yeah. And um, you certainly have, you know, some of the areas that uh, they're not all created equal, right? You have some of these that are already at new highs. I mean, Denbury, uh, ticker symbol DEN had a, a massive move today. Um, so that relative strength line looks very different. Um, yeah. A lot of the gas names uh, have, have been looking very interesting. I mean, we've been talking about Antero Resources, ticker symbol AR. So um, there, there, there's, there's some of these out there that are, you know, looking, looking like setups, but they might still, um, you know, have that volatility because there's still a lot of news kind of moving these around. Um, speaking of which, let's maybe shift over to retail. Um, this week we had Walmart um, reporting and, uh, you know, it, it, it really kind of shifted things for retail. Uh, big gap up for Walmart, uh, ticker symbol WMT. Of course, one of the things that they did, and I feel like this is something that has been happening a little bit this earnings season. Uh, they kind of Hey, let's lower our expectations, folks. Uh, let's let's not expect too much out of us. And then when the earnings come out, they're beating expectations. And it seems like the companies that have done that and managed that well are are having some really strong gains. And remember, it was just last quarter that Walmart and Target both, you know, I mean, they they, they kind of dragged the market down with them as they came out with their earnings and and were down like twenty percent or more, um, you know, because of everything that was going on with their 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 supply chain overstocked on some things not having the right things costs increasing because of inflationary labor shipping everything like that so um so what, what's what's your take on retail right now and then maybe we can shift over to costco which is uh one of the stocks that looks a little bit stronger yeah so i'm covering the the retail sector for william o'neill and uh yeah the consumer still is fa facing a lot of pressure right, cause of inflation. And Walmart was kind of the perfect example. And Walmart was uh, a gap down the la that last earnings report back in May uh, because they, as you said, they had the wrong mix. Uh, a lot of consumers, especially on the bottom half, they're really getting squeezed because of inflation. And so they don't have a lot of money. So they're shifting away from discretionary kind of items to non-discretionary. Right. where they're getting their groceries and, and they're getting just their essentials and cutting out everything else. And so apparel, right? And, and Walmart uh, guided earlier uh, a few weeks ago, which caused that other gap down uh, back in July. They got it down and said apparel was especially getting hit. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so the consumer on the bottom end for sure is getting hit. We've heard that consistently through all of the retail, all of the retailers. Now, as you said, with that guide down that they did a few weeks ago, they guided low enough that when they reported earnings, it wasn't as bad as they were saying. I mean, it's still bad. I, mm -hmm. I mean, they still negative one uh, earnings per share uh, on a percentage basis. I mean, it's still bad, uh, but it's not as bad. And that, that's been kind of the consistent theme throughout this quarter for not just retail, but a lot of stocks uh, throughout the market where it's bad, but not as bad. And then you see the stocks gap up. Uh, and so you kind of see that Walmart. Now, that being said, it's above the 200 day, but there's so much technical damage yeah. on the stock. Still need It's still going to need uh, time. Now, at Target, they said similar things as Walmart that, yeah, they've been able to aggressively price down their inventory. They're they're starting to get rid of all that excess inventory, and uh, they're hopeful for the second half that things are going to start turning around. But when you look at the chart, there's just so much damage on it yeah. that when using our methodology, it's, we're, it's not going to really come up on our radar for a long, long time uh, because it's just going to take a lot, a lot of time to kind of recover from all the heavy selling that it experienced uh, last quarter. But then you shift over to Costco, and it looks like, hey, no problem here. And hey, I got to admit, um, th this is where we do a lot of our grocery shopping, you know. <laughs> so yeah. uh, in terms of the discretionary, we're not 
doing so much of, of that at Costco, we are doing a lot of, I mean, groceries and gas, right? If you want to kind of uh, get, get gas, that's, you know, I, I actually filled up with uh, under $5 a gallon for the first time in a long time uh, th- this past week. Uh, so Costco has kind of more of that classic look. I mean, it certainly had a gap down uh, in May uh, along with yep. a lot of the retail stocks, but now we've gotten back above the 50 day. We've gotten back above the 200 day and arguably we've got a, you know, decent looking cup with handle, um, albeit with, you know, some damage on that left hand side. Yeah, if, if you have to buy a larger retailer, Costco is probably right up there of ones to consider. Uh, and as you said, it's it's a big cup with handle. It came down on much heavier volume than coming up. So that is a concern here. Uh, but it is above those key moving averages. Now, one other concern is you're, you are seeing a deceleration of earnings. The revenue the revenues for the, is, is still OK, but they're a little bit slowing down on the revenue. Uh, and so it's kind of going the opposite direction of that, what we want to see. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, it, it's a concern. But if, if you're running more of a, a relative book where you have to be invested most of the time and you need exposure to retail, then this is a, this is a place to consider p- putting some money uh, until better options come around. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that'll do it for us today. Arusha, thanks for uh, breaking all that down. And we'll certainly, now that I know that you're covering retail, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass you with questions. That, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and uh, again, it was great having Omid on. Next week, we're going to have Kathy Donnelly back on the show. Uh, she, of course, is, um, I mean, she went to so many of our master's programs. Right. Uh, she was running one of our IBD meetups out in the Denver area. And she is a co-author of The Life Cycle Trade. So with some of these IPOs looking a little bit more interesting, maybe we'll see if some of these had on through their due diligence phase, phases. So I uh, hope you join us for that. And thank you so much for joining us this week. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye now. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.